Last week I preached through the first 11 verses, and the title of my sermon was Faith-Filled Complaints. So I'll give kind of a quick recap of what that sermon was about. We looked at the first 11 verses where the prophet has a conversation with the Lord. And the prophet, in essence, gives his first complaints to the Lord and says, Lord, the law is paralyzed, justice is not going forth, the, the wicked are surrounding the righteous. Habakkuk found himself in a time of a spiritual revolt against God and rebellion with all throughout the land. And we're going to talk about why that happened. It was due to the reign of King Jehoiakim. And if you recall, he was the son of Josiah, who was a righteous king, but he did not follow in the footsteps of his father. So Habakkuk brought complaints unto the Lord, and the Lord responded to his complaints by saying that he was going to raise up the Chaldeans or the Babylonians to come and utterly destroy and judge the people of Judah. And then Habakkuk is pretty much saying, okay, Lord, how are you going to raise up a more wicked nation than even ours to judge us? And that was part of the tension that the prophet found himself in. And again, that sermon last week was entitled Faith-Filled Complaints. It's on YouTube. If you weren't here last week, if you'd like to watch it, you can do that. So, this morning, we're going to be looking at verses 12 to 17, which is the second complaint that Habakkuk brings into the Lord, and we'll go into the first verse of chapter 2. Now, I want to focus on the king who was in charge at this time. It was Jehoiakim. Jameson and I, before service today, we were talking about how one man, just one person, and you see this throughout all of human history, how one person can lead to the demise and the destruction of a literal nation. Just one wicked influence that goes unchecked, that's allowed to spread throughout the land, can literally destroy a people. So I want to take at some. Of, I want to take a look at some of King Jehoiakim's greatest hits, so to say, to see just how wicked this man was. So according to 2 Kings 22, 37, now this is not a title that you want attributed to you if you were a king of Israel in the Old Testament, but this is what it says. Jehoiakim did evil in the sight of the Lord. And if you're familiar with the Old Testament text, you see that a lot with the different kings of Israel. The vast majority of them in the northern kingdom and the majority of them in the southern kingdom or Judah. So much so, this king did so much wickedness that Habakkuk cried out in verse 4 of chapter 1. You can look at it with me. He said the law is paralyzed. The law of God is, is unable to restrain the evil of this king. And justice was not going forth at all. So Jehoiakim's reign, he was enforcing his wickedness upon the people. And justice was completely tossed out the door. And the wicked were surrounding or bullying in the righteous and justice was perverted. Now this was, again, during Jehoiakim's administration, so to say. So he was the one responsible, more than anyone else, for the moral condition of the land and the people. Isn't that interesting? The civil magistrate was responsible, more than anyone else, for the condition of the land. So because of his ongoing, unrepentant sin, the Lord sent King Nebuchadnezzar II in 605 B.C., just four years into Jehoiakim's reign to invade Judah. And during this pact, the king was taken captive, he was put in chains, and he was carted off to Babylon. And this was during the same time that Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were also taken to Babylon. Eventually, Jehoiakim was sent back to Jerusalem since he agreed to be King Nebuchadnezzar's servant and to pay him tribute. So this evil king chose to enslave himself to a pagan king instead of Yahweh. Instead of kissing the son and paying reverence to him like Psalm 2 commands, he decided to kiss the ring of King Nebuchadnezzar. And during this period, the prophet Jeremiah, who was a major prophet, he was sent to the king to call him to repent and to warn him of the judgment to come. Now you would think Jehoiakim at this time would be humbled a little bit, and would heed the words and the warnings of the weeping prophet. But sadly, this did not happen. Rather, he banished Jeremiah from his royal court. Similar to how Pharaoh of old banished Moses from his royal court, when Moses was demanding Pharaoh to let his people go. That is a common theme we see throughout history. When magistrates are confronted by godly men, they just banish them. So Jeremiah... 
unable to go before the king, decided to send a letter on a scroll to be read before the king, a gospel tract of sorts. And Jeremiah 36, 23 and 24 records, as Jehudi, this was the person reading the scroll, when he read three or four columns, the king would cut them off, Jehoiakim would cut them off with a knife and throw them into the fire until the entire scroll was consumed in the fire that was in the fire pot. Yet neither the king nor any of the servants who heard all of these words were afraid, nor did they tear their garments. Instead of tearing their garments and, and putting on ashes and sackcloth on them, which was a sign of repentance, they doubled down in their sin, and he hardened, him, hardened his heart like the Pharaoh of old. So about 11 years into his reign, and I think due to his pride and other foolishness, he decided to stop paying tribute to King Nebuchadnezzar. And according to Josephus, the Jewish historian, this is what he wrote. He said, Jehoiakim was killed during the siege, so Nebuchadnezzar sieged the city, and he was killed, Jehoiakim, and his body was thrown over the city wall. And this was fulfilling Jeremiah's prophecy and warning in Jeremiah 22, 19. Again, it's amazing how one evil man can bring so much destruction upon a nation by their wicked, rebellious rule. And King Jehoiakim is a clear example of this. So this got me thinking. Since many people in our country are embracing socialism, as a recent Gallup poll just reported, listen to this, socialism is just as popular amongst young adults as capitalism. And since socialism is the gateway to communism, I thought I would highlight some famous socialists and communist dictators of the last hundred years. You think of a man like Adolf Hitler, who was a left-wing socialist. You know, he's depicted as a right-winger. Adolf Hitler was not a right-winger. He was not conservative in any fact of the matter. He was a big government socialist. All of his policies were left and how he bewitched the German people with his religion, his pagan religion of Nazism. And what happened? Six million Jews lost their lives in the concentration camp, and over 60 million people died worldwide, whether directly or indirectly, due to Adolf Hitler starting World War II. You think of a man like Joseph Stalin, he was a Russian dictator who rose to power shortly after the communistic revolution began in Russia in the early 1920s, and that was started by Lenin. He contributed to the deaths of over 20 million of his own people through forced famine, judicial executions, and millions in the gulag. And then you think of Chairman Mao, the first communistic dictator of China, is estimated to have killed between 40 and 80 million of his own people. Now, our brains cannot simply fathom these numbers. And here's the crazy thing about this. These individuals didn't live a 1,000 years ago or 500 years ago. In fact, these individuals lived when your grandparents were alive. Or perhaps some of your parents were born while they were still living. This is recent in world history. This literally just happened 50 to 100 years ago where hundreds of millions of people lost their lives during socialistic and communistic regimes. And who can ignore, ignore our former president, Barack Hussein Obama, the socialist we had in the White House for eight years? You know, much of the wickedness that we have going on in our nation today can be directly contributed to what he built. You think Joe Biden and his presidency is any accident? He is just going piggyback off and right with what Barack Hussein Obama started as well. And think about the dragoons they surrounded themselves with. And they have seemingly been raised up, the Biden administration and the Obama administration, to hasten our decline as a world power, both uh, militarily, economically, and morally. And as I said last week, many of us in this room are groaning under the weight and burden of the wicked rulers that we have in our midst. Not only the ones found in Washington, D.C., in that giant swamp, but also the ones found in our own backyards who have really revealed themselves since this whole COVID crisis began. Now, one of my favorite founding fathers, Patrick Henry, he's the man who said, give me liberty or give me death. He wrote these words about 200 years ago. Listen to this. He says, bad men cannot make good citizens. 
It is impossible that a nation of infidels or idolaters should be a nation of freemen. It is when a people forget God that tyrants forge their chains. Let me read that again. It is when a people forget God that the tyrants begin to forge their chains. And that is exactly what we have, have happening right now in our American context. So, this morning I'm going to be focusing on verses 12 to 17 of chapter 1 here in Habakkuk. And then we will also be looking at chapter 2, verse 1. The title of my sermon is this, Watchful Christian Soldiers. Let us pray. Heavenly Father. Again, Lord, we thank you for the prophet Habakkuk and the ministry that you raised him up for. And we thank you, God, for giving us this book that we can read and study 2,600 years ago after it was written, Father. Many of the things and struggles that the prophet went through then is what we're currently going through now in our American context. So, Lord, I pray through the power of your Holy Spirit as we read and study your word together. You would illuminate those things that need to be illuminated, and you would use it to accomplish your purposes. We pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ. So, again, we're going to look at verses 12 to 17. This is Habakkuk's second complaint unto the Lord. And if you recall, the Lord informed the prophet that he was raising up a more wicked nation, the Chaldeans or the Babylonians, to be an instrument of judgment upon his people. And in chapter, I'm sorry, chapter 1, verse 7, the Lord sums up the Babylonians. This is how the Lord describes them. He says, they are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. So the Babylonians were a people who were a law unto themselves. And like the people in the book of Judges, they did what was right in their own eyes. This is called moral anarchy. They determined what was right and wrong, and that is a terrifying prospect when a person de uh, develops their own morality because our hearts are sinful and will always lead us to do evil. And this was obviously a terrifying prospect to the prophet because he loved his people. He didn't want to see them conquered by such a wicked nation. It is important to note in the second complaint, before we read it, that Habakkuk is not addressing the Lord in unbelief, but rather what I think you would call a perplexed faith. Unbelief is sin and rebellion against the Lord. A perplexed faith is more of an honest observation and estimation of the current circumstances. So Habakkuk expressed such to the Lord because he didn't understand how God would raise up a more wicked nation to judge his people. You know how the saying goes, two wrongs don't make a right. And this is what you get when you read these verses, the sense of what the prophet was thinking. So let's read in verse 12. The prophet responds back to the Lord, Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die, O Lord. You have ordained them as a judgment, and you, O Rock, have established them for reproof. You who are of pure eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? You make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. He brings them all, he brings all of them up with a hook. He drapes them out with his nets. He gathers them in his drape net, so he rejoices and is glad. Verse 16. Therefore he sacrifices to his net and makes offerings to his drape net, for by them he lives in luxury, and his food is rich. Is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? I will take my stand at my watch post. And station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. All right, let's go through these verses one by one. Let's take a look at verse 12. The prophet says, Are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? The prophet responds to the Lord with a rhetorical question as he reflected upon God's immutability and his covenant relationship with him. The immutability of God is an attribute that God is unchanging. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever in his character, his will, and his covenant promises. So the prophet reasons and says, Lord, you are unchanging and you keep your promises. How can you permit to send disaster unto us? Lord, will you not keep your covenant promises that you made with Abraham, 
with Moses and with David? Now the prophet proceeds to answer his own rhetorical question. He asked the Lord in the second part of verse 12, which reads, We shall not die, O Lord. You have ordained them as a judgment, and you, O Rock, have established them as a reproof. So Habakkuk here comes to grips with God's sovereign plans and his purposes, that the Lord is raising up the wicked Babylonians as a tool of judgment in order to discipline his people. This judgment is meant to bring reproof or correction for the purpose of bringing them to repentance, to bringing them to their knees so that they will repent and start producing fruits of repentance. As Hebrews 12 reminds us, my son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. Why? God is treating you as sons. And the rest of those verses go on to state, if you're not being disciplined of the Lord when you are in sin and rebelling against him, it's because you're an illegitimate child and you're not God's son. Discipline is for our good. And this is a reminder that our Heavenly Father knows what's best for His wayward children. And there are times in our life when the Lord disciplines us, like we do to unrepentant sin that we have in our lives. If you're hiding sin in your closet, if you're hiding it from your spouse or from your parents, the Lord is likely coming for you if you're His and will discipline you and chastise you. Before it gets to that point, Dad. repent and get right with Dad. him. So due to the severity of the sin and rebellion of these Jewish people 2,600 years ago, they were to experience the utter consequences of the rebellion against Yahweh by having their entire lives uprooted, their religious system destroyed, and their children made slaves to the Babylonians. Imagine that for a second. Your children being taken away into a foreign land with hooks in their mouths. Your daughters being violated by brutal, merciless soldiers. We can't even fathom that. But that's exactly what happened. The Lord was disgusted with the worship of this hypocritical people that he decided to just completely abolish their whole religious system. Solomon's temple was completely destroyed. And it would take 500 years before sacrifices would be able to be made happen again in the temple. Behold the righteous judgments of God. And I cannot help but see the similarities of what is happening in our American context today. It is as though the Lord has sent an invisible enemy to the shores of America that has judged every aspect of our nation, from exploding crime rates to massive inflation to unparalleled debt, again, to the revealing of wicked tyrants and phony Republicans all over a virus that has a 99.5% survival rate or more. We're talking about a cold virus. This ain't the Black Plague. It's not like we don't have the medical technology to fight against it. You think it's an accident that our government leaders have literally lost their minds and how they've handled all this? You think it's an accident that nearly seven trillion dollars, seven trillion dollars of new national debt has been added in the last 18 months alone? You remember that term, generational theft, that the Republicans used to use all the time, especially when Obama was president, because he was adding to the debt at such a record rate? Well, guess what? Trump and Biden have added considerably more debt the last 18 months to our nation than Obama did in almost eight years. This is how massive it's been. You think it's an accident that President Biden was elected to office not by we the people. <laughs> he wasn't elected by we the people. But rather mainstream media, the tech oligarchs, the global elites, and perhaps even China, who I think purposely released this virus, coincidentally just, what, nine, ten months before the election was to happen? Because Trump was flexing his muscles and putting sanctions on the CCP, the communist, Chinese Communist Party. And they decided to do everything in their power to make sure they had a puppet in place instead of him. 
Guys, this is not an accident. Wake up. Open your eyes. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. Use your reason and common sense. Again, withhold the judgment of God. I reflect and I wonder just a few months into the pandemic when 99% of the churches were closed. We closed our doors when people were desperate and hurting. We shut our doors down. But you know what? I think the Lord did it on purpose. I think he was tired of the hypocritical worship that he was receiving from most of his churches. He can't even call them that in America. And he said, you know what? I'm going to send you home in front of your computers. And statistics tell us many of those people have not even come back to church. Well, praise God, because you know what? They went out from us, but they were not of us. So thankfully, it has exposed some of the wicked individuals we have in our churches. But again, this was for a reason. And you know what? I'll say this, too. I'm thankful for our pastor who never closed our doors. Amen. For one Sunday, even when we only had 10 people coming in that March 2020 when things were real bad, I'm thankful for his leadership. Although I'll be honest, I questioned it a little bit early on. But I'm thankful that he left the church doors open. So what God is doing to the American church and our country today, I believe, is very similar to what he did to his own chosen people 2,600 years ago when he judged their religious system entirely. And sadly, through my vantage point, God is judging this churchianity we have in America, but sadly, it's not really producing that much fruits of repentance. I don't feel like things are much different today than they were prior to this COVID madness amongst the church. And because of that, we are going to continue to be in exile. Let's look at verse 13. The prophet says, You who are of pure eyes than to see evil, and cannot look at wrong, why do you look idly at traitors, and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? So the prophet's optimism and confidence that he had at the latter part of verse 12 is tempered as he reflects upon the holiness of God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, our God is a holy God. And he is totally separate from anything that is contrary to his nature. The prophet struggles here to reconcile how God can use sinful beings, the wicked Babylonians, sinlessly to accomplish his plans and his purposes. Now, I'm not going to try to explain this paradox as to how the Lord uses sin sinlessly, but we can trust the workings of God. We can trust his words, even if they defy our reason and our logic, which, if you recall, is thoroughly tainted by the fall. I believe that the topic of holiness is something American Christians have long forgotten. A few years ago, I was listening to a question and answer session of John MacArthur, and he lamented at how few questions he gets on the topic of holiness. Whereas in the 1960s and 1970s, when his ministry first began, that was the most popular question he received from people. How do I live a life of holiness? How do I separate myself from the world? He said he rarely gets that question anymore. I think the reason is, is we've been conditioned and so accustomed to all the evil and wickedness around us that it just becomes an extension of our lives. And most of us, it's part of our lives. Sadly, we love the things the world loves. We don't rightfully hate the things that God hates. Let's look at 1 John chapter 2. Turn with me there quickly. First John chapter 2. Starting with verse 15. away, 
along with its desires, for whoever does the will of God abides forever. 150 years ago, my favorite Christian author, J.C. Ryle, he preached a sermon entitled, Lot Lingered, and I would like to read to you a portion of that scripture. If you recall, righteous Lot, when he was in Sodom, he was surrounded by all that moral filth and wickedness, but he still lingered in it, which ultimately caused his wife's soul to be destroyed. If you recall, she had been left Sodom, and she turned back and was judged by God and turned into a pillar of salt. And also his two daughters were morally corrupted as well. Or if you read on a little bit more, and I won't read it here, but what happened between Lot and his daughters after they fled Sodom. Now, Ryle wrote these following words, which I believe are just as applicable to us, 21st century American Christians, as it was to his audience, 19th century uh, English. This is what Ryle says. Would you know what the times demand? The shaking of nations, the uprooting of ancient things, the overturning of kingdoms, the stir and relentlessness of men's minds? They all say Christian do not linger. Would you be found ready for Christ at his second appearing, your loins girded, your lamp burning, yourself bold and prepared to meet him? Then do not linger. Would you enjoy strong assurance of your own salvation in the day of sickness and on the death of bed, or on the bed of death? Would you see with the eye of faith, heaven opening, and Jesus rising to receive you? Do you want that assurance? Then do not linger. Would you leave great, great, broad evidences behind you when you are gone? Would you like this to lay you in the grave with comfortable hope and talk of your state after death without a doubt? Then do not linger. Would you be useful to the world in your day and generation? Would you draw men from sin to Christ and make your master's cause beautiful in their eyes? Then do not linger. Would you help your children and relatives towards heaven and make them say, we will go with you and not make them infidels and despisers of religion? Then do not linger. Would you have a great crown in the day of Christ's appearing and not be the least and smallest star in glory and not find yourself the last and lowest in the kingdom of heaven? Then do not linger. Oh, let not one of us linger. Time does not Death does not, judgment does not, the devil does not, the world does not, neither let the child of God linger. Sadly, I believe many Christians, like the righteous lot, are lingering in proverbial Sodom. And because of this, they cannot rightly discern the times and the seasons that we find ourselves in. We have been infected by worldliness a virus much more dangerous to our souls and lives than COVID-19 that has caused much spiritual damage to our souls and has made us ineffective soldiers of the Lord. You know, CJ and I, Charles over here, and I, we have this conversation, Lord, why don't more Christian men minister on the streets? Why don't more Christian men go before their magistrates and call them to repentance when they govern like devils? Why don't more Christian men Go to abortion clinics and plead for the lives of those children who are being taken to the slaughter. You know the conclusion that we came to, especially CJ? Worldliness. It's a killer of salty Christians. The reason that most Christians are not fulfilling the Great Commission and preaching the gospel on the streets and seeking to make disciples is because of the worldliness in their lives. Most Christian men statistics tell us are addicted to pornography and other sexual deviant sins, and other bondages around them, and that's why they don't do anything for the Lord. They can't, they're in bondage to this world. But brothers and sisters in Christ, resolved by the grace of God to break through those bondage and be an effective soldier of Jesus Christ. For you will stand before the Lord before you know it. Yesterday I was 18, tomorrow I'll be 40, not literally, but soon, but life is fleeting, it's a vapor, you will see Christ before you know it, resolve to live for him, and do not linger in compromise and sin. Let's read verse 14. You make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. So the prophet here is comparing the Jewish people who are about to be thoroughly judged 
to helpless fish in the sea and crawling things that have no rulers to protect them. They are at the mercy of the wicked. The Proverbs tells us the mercy of the wicked is cruel. Deprived of the loving protection of their heavenly Father. What a dreadful position to be in. Take a look at verse 15 and 16. He brings all of them up. This is talking about the Babylonians here, okay? With the hook. He drags them out with his nets. He gathers them in his drag nets. So he rejoices and is glad. Therefore he sacrifices to his nets and makes offerings to his drag nets. For by them... He lives in luxury, and his food is rich. So the Babylonians again are described here, and they will draw up the helpless Jews like a fisherman reels in and draws up his catch. And what the Lord is describing here refers to the ancient practice of conquering nations, when they would lead away their captives with hooks in their noses or their lower lips which was not only painful, but also humiliating. Mesopotamian documents depict long lines of captives with hooks through their lips being dragged off to Babylon, literally miles long. This was a fulfillment of Amos 4.2, who prophesied and warned the wayward peoples of the coming judgment some 40 years before Habakkuk even writes his book. Listen to what the Lord says through Amos. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness, Behold, the days are coming upon you, when they shall take you away with hooks, even the last of you with fish. Verse 17. Is he then, speaking of the Babylonians, is he then to keep on emptying his nets and mercilessly killing nations forever? I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower And look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaints. So the prophet just asks himself, Lord, are you going to let these wicked Babylonians continue to devour nations where everyone is gathered into their dragnet? Are you going to let them rule over us forever? That's how powerful the Babylonians were. You remember Nebuchadnezzar's vision of the statue? And then you get the gold and the bronze and the silver and everything. Who was the top of the statue? The Babylonians. They were the gold. They were the world power. Why do you think it's called Babylon in the book of Revelation? Habakkuk knew how ruthless and powerful these people were. So he's thinking to himself, Lord, is the whole world going to be devoured by these people? So what does he decide to do? Let's look at chapter 2, verse 1. He says, I will stand at my watch post. And station myself on a tower, and look out to see what he will say to me, and what I will answer concerning my complaint. So he's going to make a stand, he's going to be a watchman, to watch for the enemy and wait to receive a word from the Lord. So Habakkuk, he repeats this phrase twice in these last two verses here. He says, I will take my stand at my watch post. Regardless of what the Lord is doing in my midst, even though I adamantly object to his sovereign plan to judge the Jewish people and send the Babylonians there to destroy them, I will still take my stand at the watch post. I will not stick my head in the sand as judgment comes and remains silent or wait to be raptured out before things get really bad. I will take my stand at my watch post. Even if my life is destroyed and I experience the consequences of the sin of my people, even though I wasn't complicit in their sin, I will still take my stand at my watch post. Even though I'm despised and rejected for being a prophet of the people, exposing their deeds of darkness, and speaking truth to people, remember, truth sounds like hate to those who hate the truth, I will take my stand at my watch post. Even if it costs me my ease, my comfort, my reputation, I will take my stand at my watch post. Brothers and sisters in Christ, would you, like the prophet, take your stand at the watch post? I'm inviting you to do such this morning. As a watchman ascends to higher ground 
in order to be able to see everything around him and discern when the enemy is coming, Habakkuk here, he sets his heart like flint to wait upon the Lord in readiness to hear God's voice to discern the coming events. This is why the prophets are referred to as watchmen in the Old Testament. I want to quickly go through some characteristics of watchmen that we see in the Bible, some examples here. Number one, the watchman never rests nor slumbers, and they raise their voice when danger is imminent. They don't take days off. They don't travel to foreign lands to have vacation time and fun. When they know the enemy is coming down quickly to them, they keep their eyes diligent, they stay sober-minded, and they keep their eyes fixated on the coming danger. And they raise their voices when it comes. Isaiah 62, verses 6 and 7 says, On your walls, O Jerusalem, I have set a watchman. All the day and all the night they shall never be silent. You who put the Lord in remembrance, take no rest. And give him no rest until he establishes Jerusalem and makes it the praise in the earth. Number two, the watchman communicates the words and the warnings that he receives from the Lord. The watchman does not water down God's word. The watchman does not tickle the ears of the people. The watchman many times reigns on the parade of the wicked. Why? Because he's got a fire and a zeal in his bones from the Lord, and he has to declare the message because he loves those people. Amen. The person who tells you the most truth about the sin in your life is actually the person who loves you the most. Do you realize that? The person who turns a blind eye to your sin and allows you to continue to travel on the path of destruction doesn't truly really love you. They don't have your best interest in mind. And the watchmen, no matter what their word is, they will be faithful in declaring it. As Ezekiel 3.17 says, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. Number three. This is important. because This is definitely applicable to us. When God is judging the nation, most times the watchmen will be ignored. The Lord says the following through the weeping prophet Jeremiah in chapter 6 of his book. He says this, I have set watchmen over you, saying, pay attention to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, we will not pay attention. Therefore, hear, O nations, and know, O congregation, what will happen to them. Hear, O earth, behold, I am bringing disaster upon this people, the fruit of their devices, because they have not paid attention to my words. And as for my law, they have rejected it. Mm. Uh -oh. The Lord said something similar to the prophet Isaiah in chapter 6. After the Lord divinely commissioned the prophet. You may recall Isaiah 6. Isaiah has that throne room experience where he sees the cherubim and the seraphim flying around the throne room of God. And saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. This breaks Isaiah until he gets to a point. He says, woe is me, for I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And then the angel came and took the tongs and, and put the coal on his lips and, and, and refined him in essence. And then the Lord commissioned Isaiah and said this. He says, go and say to this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but will not perceive. Make the hearts of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Mm. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to realize this. Many times our preaching, especially in the open air, as the Lord raises us up to proclaim the gospel, especially to the masses that we find in Indianapolis. And why do we go to Indianapolis? It's the capital city. Same way God sent the prophets to the capital cities, Samaria, Jerusalem. It's the same thing he does here as well. And you know what? We want to proclaim the gospel. We want to see people saved. We want to see people won to Christ. That's the reason we go out and do it. But you know what the Lord many times, I believe, does with our preaching? He uses it as an instrument of judgment against the people. He uses our preaching to further harden their hearts. This is just what we are experiencing right now in our nation. A mass apostasy, a hardening away from the Lord. But we cannot remain silent. 
just because we don't see visible results. We can't be pragmatic. We have to be faithful in delivering the message that God has put in us. Number four. Finally, the watchman is accountable for the blood of his people if he remains silent. Turn with me to Ezekiel 33. Brother John read this portion uh, this morning, but I want to take a look at it again. Ezekiel chapter 33. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he was a martyr, he was killed by the Nazis. He said this, silence in the face of evil is evil itself. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. Let me read that again. Silence in the face of evil is evil itself. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak remains silent is to speak. Not to act to remain indifferent is to act. Ezekiel chapter 33, starting with verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, speak to your people and say to them, If I bring the sword upon the land, and the people of the land take a man from among them, and make them their watchmen. And if he sees the sword coming upon the land, and blows the trumpet and warns the people, then if anyone who hears the sound of the trumpet does not take warning, and the sword comes and takes them away, his blood shall be upon his own head. So what the Lord is saying here is simply this. The watchman has one responsibility. To blow the trumpet and warn of the judgment to come. And if he does that, it fulfills his obligation, his call before the Lord to act as such. And the people ignore his trumpet sound and refuse to prepare for battle. Their blood is on their own hands. The watchman's hands are clean. He heard the sound of the trumpet and did not take warning. His blood shall be upon himself. But if he had taken warning, he would have saved his life. Verse 6. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet so that the people are not warned, and the sword comes and takes any one of them, that person is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at the watchman's hands. Brothers and sisters, men masquerading as pastors in our churches in America all across who will never bring a, a word of a condemnation or, or a rebuke of any sin of anyone in their church's lives or in society as a whole. It's like they just completely ignore Sodom in our streets and turn a blind eye to the coming judgment that God is releasing upon our land. The blood of those lost souls will be on the hands of of those cowardly pastors. And brothers and sisters in Christ, we have many of them in the pulpits today. You wonder why our nation is devolving such. You wonder why we have so much wickedness spreading throughout the land. Why is that? The salt has lost its saltiness. Hmm. And what did Jesus say? It's only good for nothing except to be thrown down on the ground and trodden under the feet of the wicked men. Why do you think we have so many wicked men trotting under the feet? of the church today, it's because we have saltless Christians in the pews and even worse, behind the pulpit. Verse 7. So you, son of man, I have made a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give the warning from me. Again, we are ambassadors of Christ. We don't speak in our own accord or our own authority. We just communicate what God has revealed. That is what a faithful gospel preacher does. Verse 8, if I say to the wicked, O wicked one, you shall not surely die. And you do not speak to and warn the wicked to turn from his way. That wicked person shall die in his iniquity. But his blood I will require at your hand. This is a serious matter. This is the blood of God. If you do not warn the wicked to turn away from their sin, you will be responsible for their soul. This is a heavy, weighty matter, brothers and sisters in Christ. Verse 9, but if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, that person shall die in his iniquity. Iniquity is another word for sin. But you will have delivered your soul. So brothers and sisters in Christ, in closing here, our present and current distress is severe. Our nation is apostatizing at an alarming rate. 
The Lord is judging us through depopulation as our birth rates hit historic lows. We have been given over to massive debts and ruled by tyrants. So I'm calling on every person in this room to count the cost and to be a watchman for the Lord. The soul of our nation hangs in your balance, and the soul of your children also hang in the balance. May the Lord give us the grace to persevere amongst this wicked and perverse generation. And may the Lord raise us up to be effective salt and light. And may we never water down his word. May we be faithful to the end. When Jesus said, he who endures to the end will be saved. Let us pray. Oh Lord, your word is heavy this morning, Father. As I was preparing it, Father, I was so convicted of the only inadequacies in my own life. The worldliness that has gripped me in, in different areas, Father, forgive me. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, Father. Purge me with hasa, like the psalmist said, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Make me hear the joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Oh, Lord, grant us all the deeper repentance of resolve to live for you, Lord, in this day and age. Again, Father, we don't understand why everything is happening the way it is, but we trust you, Father. We trust your plans and your purposes. It's not an accident. We are where we're at in our country. For, Lord, you have ordained it. And, Father, help us to count the cost. Wean us from this world. Make us more effective soldiers for Jesus Christ. And may we share your gospel with truth and boldness, but also with love, as we will proclaim repentance, Father, fix such love for these lost people in our nation. So we do look at them as the enemy. The reality is we do not battle against flesh and blood, but principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness in this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Lord, remind us of that, Father, as we proclaim the sword of truth your word. And Lord, I pray every person in here be a watchman for you, Father. For they can only be done by your grace and your mercy. We pray this all. Plead the Son of